Okay, uh, we're going to get started here. I see it's just after four o'clock, and I appreciate everybody being on the, the line with us. Uh, this is going to be recorded, so if you want to uh, get access to this afterwards, happy to, to send that out to you. Uh, but yeah, just appreciate uh, you all tuning in. Uh, just FYI, our next webinar will be on Tuesday, March 30th at 1 p.m. We'll be sending out information about that. We're going to uh, do it on um, the FAFSA, what you need to know about all the changes in the college process. Uh, Heidi King is going to be joining us from College Inside Track. Uh, they're a, a national expert on uh, college admission planning. So if you or someone in your family or friends would want to attend that, feel free to forward the invitation when you get it. And um, we're looking forward to having that presentation on Tuesday the 30th at 1 p.m. But uh, yeah, today we are going to talk about uh, estate planning. And our, our title today is Securing Your Legacy, uh, Estate Planning for Your Future. And we're very fortunate to have uh, Diana Eisenberg. Uh, from Stroud, Will, Will Link, and Howard join us. So appreciate Diana being on the line. Uh, she is from Green Bay. So can I get a shout out to the Packers, everybody? Uh, she attended UW-Eau Claire for her undergrad and uh, attended the University of Wisconsin Law School. And I believe I saw you served uh, as an intern at the Wisconsin Supreme Court. So very cool uh, on that. So Diana, we're going to turn it over to you. Uh, in just a few minutes uh, for your presentation. Uh, but right now we have myself and, and Kevin Moore, we're gonna talk uh, just about some uh, financial updates, uh, be really brief. But before we begin, uh, since this topic is estate planning, I had to give you all my one estate planning joke uh, because that's very popular in these webinars. So a wealthy man is dying and he asked his doctor, his priest and his lawyer to do him a favor. He said, well, just in case uh, in the afterlife, afterlife I need some cash, I'm going to give each of you an envelope containing $100,000 in cash, and I just want you to bring that to my funeral and put that in my coffin. And they all agreed, absolutely be happy to do that. And then uh, at the old man's funeral, uh, each of those individuals put an uh, envelope in the coffin, and afterwards they were talking and and the doctor said, yeah, I have a confession to make. I only put in $80,000 because we really, our hospital could have used a, a CAT scan machine. So I took $20,000 out. And then the priest said, well, I kind of did the same thing. I put $50,000 into the homeless fund and I put the rest uh, in the coffin for our friend. And the lawyer was just appalled by all this. I said, I just, I can't believe that you guys did that. I want you to know that I placed my personal check for $100,000 in that coffin, and he'll be able to cash the full thing uh, if and when he wants. <laughs> <laughs> I can hear you all laughing, even though you're all uh, Afterwards, we're going to have a survey monkey come out. Uh, so I appreciate any uh, comments that you guys have um, from that. And I am going to... Uh, turn it over to Kevin, uh, who then will turn it over back to me here in a slide or two. So Kevin, take it away. All right. <clears throat> thanks, John, Diana. Thanks for being here. Um, so just wanted to spend a few minutes talking about a couple of slides here before we get into the main topic at hand. Um, so again, our future topic today is estate planning for your future, securing your legacy. And you know, as we recently turned the page on 2022, uh, we can all agree that last year was a rough year for investors. With the overall stock, U.S. stock market, as measured by the S&P 500 index, being down over 19%, and then paired that with the U.S. bond market also being down, but being down 13%, as measured by the Barclays Area Bond Index. So as you can see from the slide, uh, it, it isn't unusual for stocks to be down more than 15% in a given year as that really happens around once every three years or so. But the fact that bonds were also down last year was unusual. Now, to put that into perspective, the last time that both stocks and bonds were down in the same year was way back in 1969. Now, you might be asking yourselves, what caused bonds to be down double digits last year when bonds are normally thought of as a, you know, really portfolio stabilizers? 
The short answer to that question is that as interest rates increased somewhat rapidly last year, stemming from the Federal Reserve's effort to fight inflation, the value of bonds dropped. So to provide you a little bit more context surrounding why bond prices drop when interest, rate incre interest rates increase, I thought a basic example might help a little bit. So if I bought a bond that paid a 2% interest rate three years ago, and then I decided to sell that bond right now after interest rates have increased to, let's say, 4% on new bonds, do you think someone would be willing to pay me the full price for my old bond? Well, certainly not. As my old bond is no longer worth as much as it once was, prompting the bond buyers to either buy my bond at a discount or buy a new bond that pays a higher interest rate. Hopefully that simple example helps provide you with some general perspective on why bonds were down as much as they were last year. All right. And if you jump to the next slide. All right, thank you. So now I'm turning our attention to stocks now. I included an informational slide that shows the long-term resiliency of stocks using a bar chart, reminding you that past performance, as always, does not guarantee future results. Now this slide shows how the S&P 500 has performed over the last 97 years by plotting each positive year using a blue rectangle and each negative year using an orange rectangle with the positive years on the right half of the page and the negative years on the left half of the page. Along with this, the chart also places the positive and negative annual returns in order with the worst returns on the far left side and the best returns on the far right side. Now, what you'll notice is that in almost three quarters of the 97 years, the S&P 500 has had a positive return. On top of that, you'll notice that the average positive annual return comes in at just over 21% in comparison to the average negative annual return that comes in at just over minus 13%. So now the takeaway here is that even though we will go through years like last year where US stocks were down over 19%, with the stock market having more positive years than negative years, along with the magnitude of those positive years being stronger than the magnitude of the down years, for investors with long-term time horizons and the patience to wait out downturns, investing in, stock, in the stock market certainly can continue to be really an effective way to produce long-term returns that have historically outpaced inflation. So with all that said, I want to turn things over to John to continue with the uh, market update portion of our webinar. So if you want to take it away, John. No, thanks, Kevin. Yep. Yeah, just to, to echo Kevin's comments, there's always reasons to be scared of the market. Uh, this is a slide going back to 1970, and it just shows in blue what the general market did over that time frame, averaging about 10.5% per year rate of return. But all of these things that you see here on this slide are all reasons to be nervous, reasons to be worried, reasons to think the market's going to go down. And right now we're in one of those uh, timeframes. We don't know if the bottom is going to uh, already have occurred back in October, if we're going to hit new lows. Uh, but ultimately, it's it's about not getting scared out of the market. It's about staying invested over the long time frame so you get that trend line going up. Uh, looking at just the the last 15 years, if, if we go back to the right before we had the second biggest drop in stock market history, which was in 2008, uh, if you look at what investments have done since then, this blue line signifies just the general stock market. So there we had that really bad 08 drop, the market fell 50%. But then it started its long-term climb. And throughout this entire 15-year time frame, the market averaged about 8.5%. If you look at other asset classes, gold is this orange line, uh, averaged about 6%, which is much higher than the long-term average of gold. Uh, the 10-year treasury bond averaged 2.7% over that time frame. Inflation averaged 2.5%. Home prices up about 3.9% per year. Cash was near zero, just like oil was near zero. But again, it's, it's not necessarily about the timing. It's about the time that you have to invest. And looking at why we put up with all of these times that give us indigestion, this shows 
different bull markets and bear markets in history. And the yellow, which is very hard to see on the screen because it's not that large, these are all the different bear markets when the market has fallen more than 20%. The blue is the bull markets. And if you just kind of look at that graph, the bear markets last about 11 months on average, and the market goes down about 31%, so not a small drop. And we put up with that so we can eventually get back into a bull market, which on average lasts four and a half years and goes up 155%. So we're waiting for that next bull market. We don't know when that's going to occur, but we've had plenty of bears in the past. We've had plenty of bulls in the past, and that's going to continue to happen over time. That's why your distribution plan is important. We want to be able to ride out these bear market drops with an efficient distribution plan um, so that you don't have to worry about selling stocks during this time frame. And last slide I'll, I'll show to or show you before I turn it over to Diana is just the, the probability of positive returns. Uh, over any given one day period of time, it's a flip of a coin. Markets up 53% of the time, markets down 47% of the time. Over a three month period, period, markets up 70% of the time, down 30%. Over a three year period, markets up 88% of the time. Over a five year period, 93% of the time. Over a 10 year period, 97% of the time. Again, the longer you give it, the more the market will work in your favor. With that all being said, I am going to turn over to Diana to give our feature presentation today. And um, yeah, I'll, I'll let you take it over. Thanks, Diana. All right. Thank you, John. And it's uh, nice to nice to be here. Thanks for having me. I will try to go through the slides fairly efficiently. I want to be respectful of everybody's time. Um, we may not get to everything, but um, the slides will be available for everybody uh, after the presentation. And as you're going along, if you have questions, feel free to um, put those into the chat. And I think we'll, we'll try to get to those at the end. So um, with that, let me just get the uh, presentation up here. All right. All right. We all set? Can you see? Looks good. That's right. Excellent. Okay. So, um, as uh, as John mentioned, I'm Diana Eisenberg, and the topic of this presentation today is related to estate planning and how you can um, ensure that your goals are met through a little advanced planning. So overall today, what we will discuss is why everybody needs an estate plan, including you, um, how to get started, what the important components of an estate plan are, and some retirement account issues. I know um, that those can be kind of particularly problematic or um, important as a component of people's estate plan. So we wanted to specifically focus on retirement account issues at the end if we have time. So jumping right in, why do you need an estate plan? Um, estate plan is important for a number of reasons. Um, it is important to determine who will control and manage your assets um, during your lifetime and at your death. One um, common misconception is that estate planning is only for what happens to my assets when I die, when in reality, estate planning is, is broader and encompasses not only kind of those final distribution um, plans, but also who will manage your assets if you are incapacitated and um, not just your assets, but also healthcare decisions. So it's important to kind of designate in advance who you want to control those assets. Um, it's important to dictate who will, um, or an, an efficient estate plan will also maximize um, your the share that goes to your beneficiaries by minimizing tax liabilities and ensuring that the transfer of those assets is efficient. A third important component to estate planning is protection of privacy. Um, this is Im very important to some people, less important to others, but for, for those who want to ensure that, that their private affairs remain private, um, the, the most efficient way to do that is through through estate planning. And then finally, um, and this is a really important component as well, um, is efficiency. And to make sure that those assets are transferring in a way that 
maximizes again the value that goes to your heirs by by setting things up efficiently not only from a financial um perspective in terms of the administrative expense legal fees things like that but also just from a from a hassle expense you know a hassle perspective so nobody wants to leave a mess for their for their kids or for their family members to to manage after they're gone and estate planning is by far the most the best way to make sure that your your affairs are in order and that um, that your goals are are met. So um, with that, what happens if I don't have an estate plan? You might be thinking, um, in some circumstances, there can be significant tax problems. There could be much larger legal expenses involved in trying to sort out a messy situation. Uh, it can delay if for no other reason that your heirs may not know where the assets are, they may not know what to do, maybe they're, you know, frozen with indecision. Um, it can be very stressful for, for heirs when um, when the estate plan is not, is not organized and, and done in an efficient manner. Um, there can be conflicts, especially if there is ambiguity in the documents or if you have not clearly articulated what you want through an estate plan. Um, there can be confusion of, well, you told one person this and maybe somebody misunderstood it or um, you thought one thing would happen and, and something else is, is the way that the assets would be distributed. So those are all problems that, that I see arise when people have, have not planned in a, planned accordingly in advance. Um, and worst, you know, worst of all, perhaps you have missed something or or an asset ends up going to somebody who you didn't intend, um, either because of a beneficiary designation that didn't get updated or um or you didn't didn't know how the asset would transfer and it goes to the wrong person. So those are all um avoidable problems, but can arise if you if without proper planning. So um Typically, what I recommend is um, everybody should have an estate plan, at least um, should think about that in terms of the incapacity components. And generally, it is better to have something fleshed out and in writing, um, whether that's in a will or through a trust. Um, and periodic review of your estate plan, even if you have those documents, is also important. So anytime there is an important change in your life, um, a marriage, a divorce, births, deaths, um, or a you know significant change in your financial situation, or um, maybe you move to another state. Those are all important times to look at your estate plan. And similarly, um, if there are a bit large you know significant changes to tax law, that's also a good time to look at your estate plan. So anytime something major happens, um, you want to just double check everything and and make sure that your plan is still functioning the way that it should be and meets meets your goals. Um, so we recent fairly recently, I guess now um, there there was a kind of a significant change in the law in 2016 and in 2020 um, related to the tax laws and how those impact uh, retirement accounts. So those are some recent legal changes that may impact your estate plan. Um, and so that's why it's important to kind of periodically review. All right, so what should you do? You're ready to get your affairs in order. You'd like to set up an estate plan. How do you get started? So the first thing you need to do is think about what your goals and objectives are. Um, are you charitably inclined or how, who do you want your assets to go to? Um, how do you want them to receive those assets? Do you want their assets to be held in trust or would you prefer that things go directly to the beneficiary? Um, think about whether there are any concerns that you need to address as part of the estate plan. Certainly if you have a beneficiary who has, you know, any certain any kind of issue that's something that needs to be discussed and addressed through estate planning whether that's um, a beneficiary who has special needs or somebody who has um, maybe substance or mes mental health issues those are all things that that are important to go through and address in an estate plan um, you can think about when you want those distributions from your estate to begin do you want that to happen immediately do you want to stagger distributions over um, a longer period of time. Those are components to consider. Um, 
and what what your goals are when you're giving these assets to a beneficiary, whether it's a charity or to um, to family members or friends or or anybody else. If you have particular goals, it's important to um, clearly identify those in your estate planning documents, um, whether that's through restrictions on the on the gift um, to the beneficiary or to a charity, um, or whether that's just through kind of general um, language related to your intent to help clarify how those assets should be administered. Um, critical uh, Of critical importance is deciding who you want to be in charge of managing your affairs. Um, and this is related to who you want to act as, as an executor, a personal representative in the state of Wisconsin. Um, that's the person who would administer your probate assets, which we'll discuss in a minute. Um, who you want to manage any trusts that are created for a beneficiary or, or your own trust if you have a revocable trust, um, who you want to be the guardian if you have minor children, um, and, who, and who will be making those decisions for you while you are, if you are incapacitated prior to your death. Um, so who you'd like to make healthcare decisions and financial decisions. Those are all all critical components. And it's important to think through all of your objectives, not just financial, but also the practical implication of how your plan will play out when it is when it is actually put into play. Um, often for married couples, the a plan, especially in a, um, a first marriage and not a blended family, the, a plan will say all to my spouse on my death. Um, but if there are certain assets that you would not want to go to your spouse, that's something very important to discuss, um, not just obviously between you and your spouse, but also between with your estate planner so that those can be addressed appropriately. Because as we'll also discuss going forward, there are um, Wisconsin is a marital property state, and so there are very specific rules about how those assets can be administered and, and what each spouse's right is to those assets. So that's all important to address. Um, and often it makes sense to have a coordinated estate plan with your spouse. So um, that that's an important component also to consider. So you can have um, a joint estate plan either through kind of a revocable living trust. That's often some a plan that people will choose where each spouse is the grantor for that trust. Um, but you, you can also have your own estate plans and have them separated. But generally um, in kind of amicable situations, it, it makes sense to have everything coordinated in it and at least discussed. Um, so those are some kind some things as an initial step to consider uh, when you're starting to think through what would make sense for you as part of your estate plan. Okay, so um, something that is often a misconception is I have completed my will and now everything will transfer in the way that I planned. And often I see that people have not taken the extra step to think through um, or to look at their assets to make sure that they are appropriately titled and, a, and are set up to transfer in the way that you want. So um, a, a will or a trust is only as good as, um, as how the assets are titled. So if, you, if there's a beneficiary designation or a payable on death or a transfer on death designation on an asset, your will will not, will not address that. Um, that will go directly to that person through that mechanism. Um, so it is very important to make sure that you review those and check how those assets are titled. Um, the non-probate transfer mechanisms are very powerful and there are a number of them, um, but that's a very important component to consider. Um, so the second step after you've considered what your goals are and what, what's important to you and who you'd like to identify and um, have help you with your estate plan is to um, go through all of your assets, look at how they are titled, and check any beneficiary designations. So um, assets that are jointly titled as joint tenants or as survivorship marital property, those will transfer directly to that co-owner or spouse. Um, so there is no probate process involved that automatically will transfer to that other person. And automatically, there might be a little paperwork involved in terms of 
um, removing the, the deceased person's name from the account, but for all intents and purposes, it, it's pretty seamless. Um, if you have assets that are titled as tenants in common or just regular old marital property, that effectively means that you are able to transfer your at that asset on your death in any way you want. It doesn't have that survivorship characteristic. So those assets will not transfer directly to the co-owner. Um, this is very common with um, like jointly held real estate that maybe you inherited from a parent. Um, think of a, a family cabin, for example, where you and your siblings may each own an interest as a tenant in common. Um, you are free to, to transfer that asset then on your death in whatever manner is permitted um, under the law. Um, you may own an asset individually. So if it's titled in just your name, then you are the, you are the sole owner of that account um, with the caveat that if you are married, this is a marital property state and marital property will come into play um, regarding that asset. Even if that asset, say a bank account is only in your name, there will still be a marital property asset marital property component to that account. Um, so that is also a common misunderstanding. Um, so it's not just whatever is in your name is yours alone. There are certain things you can do to ensure that that is the case, but title alone does not dictate whether an asset is marital property or individual property. Um, and then as I discussed, any assets that have a beneficiary designation or a payable on death or transfer on death designation will supersede your estate plan. Those assets will transfer directly. Um, and whatever your estate plan says to the contrary will not govern those assets. Um, so that's an important component to think through. So um, a general overview of marital property, um, any property that you bring into a marriage would be considered your individual property, but any appreciation or income from that property is typically, well, appreciation would typically be considered your, your individual property unless there are some efforts of, a, of the spouse to maintain that asset or to manage it. Um, and, and income would typically be marital property. So there are exceptions to that, but those are kind of the general rules. Any assets or earnings that are acquired during a marriage um, in Wisconsin, this is all kind of assuming that you are a Wisconsin resident and you have resided in Wisconsin for the entire length of your marriage. Um, any assets that you uh, receive or, or own during the marriage, those are gonna be by default considered marital property. Um, so, Gifted or inherited property would be individual property, um, but again, titling does not matter in terms of determining who what who has an ownership interest in that property, but it does matter in terms of during your lifetime who has the management and control rights over that asset. So um, there are different components here. There's your rights to dispose of an asset at your death, and there's your rights to manage that asset during your lifetime, and those are separate. Um, but important to consider and think through. Um, and whether something is categorized as marital property or as individual property has implications, not just for your use during your lifetime, but also for tax purposes on your death. So um, let's talk a little more or delve into how that, how that works. So the general rule for assets that are marital property is that each spouse will control who receives their half of their of marital property and all of the individual property that they own. Um, so as I mentioned, assets that are jointly titled and or have the spouse named as a beneficiary, those will transfer directly to the spouse. Um, and for assets that you want to transfer to somebody else, maybe another family member, your children, um, you, you need to check how the asset is titled and classified and make sure that is uh, set up appropriately or your efforts, even if you've named that asset in your estate plan could be, um, might not be come to fruition. Uh, 
So it's important to check all of those things. And even if you have assets that you don't want to go to the surviving spouse, or you say, I don't want any of my assets to go to my spouse, I want them all to go to somebody else. Um, it's difficult to disinherit a spouse, I guess is the, the simple way to, to phrase that. So um, there are certainly ways to do that. And if that is both of your intentions, then there, there's mechanisms to accomplish that. But um, generally, as I mentioned, you're going to be able to dispose of all of your individual property and your undivided half interest in marital property at your death. Okay. Um, people are often concerned about estate taxes. They hear the word estate taxes and they think, oh no, I need to avoid estate taxes. Um, so kind of the first thing to consider in whether that's something that might be problematic for you is to look at, well, what is, what's the value of my estate? Do I have to worry about taxes on my estate? Wisconsin currently does not have an estate tax, um, but there is a federal estate tax and it is at a historically high level as we'll discuss, but um, your estate would generally include all of those items that are um, identified in that list. So kind of all of the things that you would normally think of, your accounts, um, your, you know, your real estate, your home, your property, things like that. But it also includes non-probate assets like um, like a retirement account is generally not a probate asset or life insurance, but those those things would be included as part of your estate for estate tax purposes. Um, if your estate would also be reduced by certain outstanding liabilities, mortgages, um, other debts, or some some kind of um, death related expenses, you know, funeral expenses, things like that. Um, so first thing first, calculate your estate to see is estate tax planning a problem for me. Um, as I mentioned, the estate tax is quite high. One of the important um, law changes was this uh, Tax Cut and Jobs Act, which dramatically expanded the estate tax exemption amount. Um, but note that this exemption is set to sunset or the amount is set to sunset back to the prior level, um, which will be $5 million, but adjusted for inflation, unless there is new congressional action, unless a new law is passed. This, this is something that will happen. Um, so effective January 1, 2026, the estate tax exemption will go back to the prior level, um, which, you know, I estimate and, you know, who knows with inflation, but um, will probably be somewhere around six to seven million dollars per person. So if you, if you have six to seven million dollars or more in, in your estate, then you might want to think about some estate tax planning. Um, or if you and your spouse together it, combined have, um, you know, 12 to $14 million, that's when you need to start thinking about estate tax planning. Um, but otherwise, the estate taxes will not impact you. Um, there are also tax implications to making large gifts. So there is um, a lifetime exclusion for gifting. Um, currently, you can give any person $17,000 or property worth $17,000. Um, you and your spouse can each do that per year without any, without needing to file a gift tax return and without any other um, real impact on your total, your total estate going forward. Um, so something to keep in mind, that's often an effective strategy for people who are um, either want to kind of reduce the value of their estates if they're concerned about um, the long-term estate tax prospects. If you think the estate tax exemption is going to go back down to kind of more historical level levels of, you know, one to two million dollars, then you might want to consider doing some gifting, um, especially to your intended beneficiaries of your estate in the long term. Um, if that makes sense for you, something to consider. Um, there's also a, a very nice benefit for a surviving spouse. Um, you can transfer any of the unused exemption that that spouse has. So assuming you have never made a taxable gift, i.e. a gift to someone in excess of that 
currently $17,000. Um, if you have never made a taxable gift, then you have not used any of your lifetime exclusion for gift and estate tax purposes. So that means that you could transfer, if your spouse dies, you can transfer their entire unused exemption to yourself um, to add on top of your exemption for on your death. So it's a powerful tool. Um, portability is something that uh, we recommend people think through when, they, when their spouse passes. Um, like there are some caveats. It's not available to everyone. You have to be a U.S. citizen, for example, but um, it, can be, it can be a very helpful kind of insurance policy to hedge against changes to estate tax laws going forward. Okay. Um, I mentioned before that for um, married couples in Wisconsin, there are some significant benefits tax-wise to having assets classified as marital property. Um, with estate tax levels at their current historically high values, much more of the estate planning focus currently is on income tax planning, which is separate from the estate tax. So um, married, married couples in Wisconsin for any marital property assets get a step up in basis on the death of a spouse. So um, this is very important for capital gains purposes. Um, a capital gain is calculated by taking the, the sale price of an asset less your basis, which is generally your purchase price, which subject to adjustments, but that's an easy way to think about it. The sale price less your purchase price, that's your gain. And that's how that's what will be used to calculate how much you owe in capital gains. Um, when a spouse dies, there is a rule that the IRS uses that says the basis, what you purchased it for, is adjusted to the fair market value of that asset as of the person's date of death. And in Wisconsin, you can do that for your spouse and on your death. So you can have a full step up in basis twice for marital property. This is a huge tax saving, particularly for if you have assets that have a low basis, either, um, and often that will be real estate that you've held for a long time, maybe, you know, the family farmland or um, a business interest, those are often things that, that you have a low basis in and that, that benefit hugely from this increase in the, in the, um, in the basis on someone's death. So, that's an important, a very important component of estate planning. Um, there are ways to address retirement assets, the, um, the period over which those retirement accounts have to be distributed um, will vary depending on what type of beneficiary we are talking about. And I'll, I'll discuss that later, but um, you know, the rules are different if it's a spouse versus a minor child versus some other adult beneficiary versus a charity. So all of those things have different payout rules and that can impact not only the growth of that asset, but also how much the beneficiary ends up paying in taxes. Um, and for those that are charitably inclined, um, a great option um, is to use pre-tax assets, especially retirement accounts, um, to fund those payments because the charity is going to get 100% of the value of that asset because they don't pay taxes. Whereas if you have a retirement account going to an individual beneficiary, they're not going to get the full value of that because they're going to have to pay taxes once they take withdrawals on that asset. So um, that's some, a little tidbit on tax planning, something that you that we think through when we're working on these estate plans. Okay, I guess I should pause for any questions. Okay, I'm going to see if we've got anybody raising their hand. If you raise your hand, I can um, unmute your line. You know, that was kind of a lot to take in, so. Maybe I'll just have you keep going, and if I see any hands raised, I'll, I'll chime in. All right, that sounds good. All right, so um, we are on to the various components of an estate plan. So, so as I mentioned previously, there are kind of two facets to estate planning. 
the first is planning for your incapacity. And, and the documents that we use to do that are financial powers of attorney, healthcare powers of attorney, a living will, and a HIPAA authorization. Um, so those are important while you are alive. Everybody should have those documents. Um, and if you don't have some of those documents, we'll talk about kind of the ramifications of that. So that's the first component of estate planning. And then at, in addition to planning for your incapacity, it's also, and this is what people typically think of when they're talking about estate planning, you need to also plan for how those assets are going to be distributed at your death, what you want to happen to, with your estate. So there are various um, components to that. You can do that through a will, through a revocable living trust, um, through a marital property agreement, or uh, and through beneficiary designations. All of those are, are components to, that will be part of an estate plan. So um, planning for incapacity, as I mentioned, estate planning involves more than um, just deciding how your assets will be distributed on your death. And um, those key documents, as I just mentioned, are related to who's gonna make decisions for you if you cannot make decisions for yourself. I guess with the caveat that the um, financial power of attorney can also be effective um, immediately and not on your incapacity. So that could just be a document you prepare to um, permit somebody to make decisions for you now. So kind of delving into those, those types of um, estate planning documents, the financial power of attorney um, will allow somebody to take financial action on your behalf. This could include paying bills for you, um, signing signing contracts or other estate, you know, real estate documents, or it could um, be authorizing your required minimum withdrawal, taking that out of your retirement account. Um, as I mentioned, your financial power of attorney can be effective immediately or on your incapacity. So it depends. Um, things to consider here are whether you want somebody to be able to act right away. Um, maybe you, you think it's time to transition the management of your financial affairs to your children. You're, you're not interested in handling that anymore. Um, that's often a scenario I see where people would choose immediately to have their financial power of attorney effective immediately. Or, um, and a lot of times people will make their financial power of attorney effective immediately for their spouse for convenience purposes. So especially if kind of one spouse typically handles all of the um, financial matters for somebody, they might prefer to say, oh, well, I'd, I'd rather have my spouse just handle that for me and be able to sign those documents. So I will make this document effective immediately, but only with respect to my spouse. I don't want my children to be meddling in my affairs yet. So for, for them, I'm only going to make this effective on my incapacity. Um, financial powers of attorney have a lot of flexibility and depending on what type of provisions you include, um, you can grant lots of powers or only limited powers. Um, there are some kind of risky powers that um, should be really thoroughly thought through before you include those types of revisions. And that would include the ability to give your assets away or make gifts, um, the ability to change your estate plan or to change your beneficiary designations um, or to use your, your assets for other people like um, for your adult children to help them with college expenses or things like that. So um, those that's what, a fi what the financial power of attorney will do. Um, and if you do not have a financial power of attorney and you are incapacitated, there will not be anybody immediately available to manage your affairs. There will not be anybody who can sign a check for you. Um, and what happens is and in that circumstance, if you can't manage things for yourself, either because of a, you know, a cognitive issue or if, if you're in an accident, something like that, where you can't manage things, um, you're somebody, whoever you would normally have designated, so often that will be a child or um, a spouse or, or something like that, they'll have to go to go to court and be appointed as your guardian. So that is a, um, a more cumbersome process, more stressful um, and it can be pretty easily avoided if you if you execute a financial power of attorney in advance. 
The next kind of set of documents are, are healthcare related. So um, again, these are related to incapacity. You, it's I recommend that people have a healthcare power of attorney for similar reasons to the financial power of attorney. This is to make sure that there's somebody who can make a medical decision for you if you are not able to do that yourself. Um, and there's kind of various components that you can authorize or not, whether you want to give your agent authority to um, you know, remove a feeding tube if you are in a persistent vegetative state in a coma, or whether you want your agent to have authority to um, send you to the send you to a nursing home, um, either for rehabilitative care or for a longer term stay. Um, so those are some components that will go into uh, your healthcare power of attorney. All of these documents, it's important to think through really who you want to make those decisions and um, what their what their skill set is. So um, somebody who would be great at making healthcare decisions for you may not be the best choice for kind of managing financial matters, and the reverse can also be true. So. Um, important to think about the skill set as well when you're deciding who you want to nominate to, to fill those roles. Um, so the living will, in, in addition to the health care power of attorney, this is slightly different in that it is a directive to the doctors on how you want them to manage your care. Um, so this is different than the health care power of attorney, which grants somebody else, your your spouse, your child, somebody somebody like that, your friend, um, the ability to make a healthcare decision for you. The living will says, physician, in this circumstance, I want you to do this thing. Um, this is how I want my care managed under these circumstances. So slightly different, um, but both, both important to include and consider. Um, and then HIPAA authorizations. This is sometimes overlooked. You often are signing these when you go to the doctor. You might you know, have a little pin pad that you just signed off and you don't really know <laughs> Don't necessarily know what you signed, um, but a HIPAA authorization allows your doctors to give medical information about you to third parties. So if, for example, you have a financial power of attorney that is only effective on your incapacity, if you have not authorized your doctors to disclose that you are incapacitated to that agent, there's kind of a, a workaround problem there, right? A chicken and the egg. You're incapacitated, but the doctors can't tell your agent that you're incapacitated. So HIPAA authorization is important to provide a mechanism to um, to tell the the people who you've designated that you you have you know certain issues like like a incapacity. Um, again, without these healthcare documents, your family members may need to be, you know a family member may need to be appointed as a guardian, um, and that's an a stressful time already and not something most people want to uh, put their loved ones through. All right, now for the main event, planning for distributions at your death. Um, so often people are concerned about probate. They have heard about probate. They heard they have heard they want to avoid probate. Um, so we're gonna talk a little bit of, briefly about what is probate, what are probate assets, um, and what are the pros and cons of avoiding probate? So non-probate assets are anything that transfers directly to somebody else, either through um, a beneficiary designation or through a survivorship characteristic in the way that it is titled, or an asset that is not owned by you in that it is held in a trust. Those three components um, make, make an asset non-probate. So for those types of assets, you're, they're not going to be included as part of your estate. They would not be subject to probate. They will transfer in, in the way that is designated through the trust or through the beneficiary designation or through the co-ownership. Um, all of your other assets that you own in your name at your death um, would be subject to probate. So a bank account, your house, those things are, you know, would be commonly be considered probate assets. Um, so kind of think through what are my probate assets and what is going to transfer directly to somebody else on my death. Um, probate is a process. 
at the end of the day. Um, it is court administered. Um, certainly in some states, it is very onerous and cumbersome. Um, it can be that way in Wisconsin as well, but it is kind of generally, um, it's hoops to jump through for your heirs. You kind of follow the process. And once you know the process and know what to do, it's not, it's not that difficult to comply with, but it, it will depend in part on um, how, what your heirs, how, how difficult people want to make the process. So um, certainly there's an opportunity for fighting in probate. There is administrative headaches and red tape, um, but it is kind of a, a structure that outlines how those assets will be trans transferred, what is required to administer your estate. Um, it typically includes providing kind of notices to certain people, um, to creditors. There are timelines that are more extended for a probate. So probate usually takes a year, 18 months. Um, some can be done more quickly, particularly if you don't have income generating assets. Um, and there are fees associated with probate. So um, not only legal fees, because often, the, like I said, once you know the process, it's not, it's not too hard, but um, most people don't know the process and they'd like somebody to guide them through that, which is often an attorney. So there are legal fees involved in probate. And there's also fees that the probate court charges. So for, um, for all of your assets, the probate court will look at your assets when you file an inventory saying, here are all my assets. And not you, but your personal representative files an inventory of your assets. Um, and the, they charge a fee. So it would be about, it's 0.2% or about $2,000 per million dollars of probate assets. So there are expenses related to probates that can be avoided if you don't need to, if you don't have any probate assets. Um, so um, there are kind of two primary estate planning vehicles. One is a will. And again, that is governed by the probate process. And then there are revocable trusts. And that is a non-probate mechanism to transfer assets. Um, so a, as I mentioned, um, the will will go through the probate process and in, in either, either document, you have the flexibility to create trust for your children. If you don't want assets to go to, to someone at 21, for example. Um, so you, you, there's still flexibility in both documents, but the, the main difference between a will and a trust is whether you want to have, have the probate process included and have that structure or whether you want the flexibility to um, have your assets administered more quickly to provide, um, to provide more efficient distributions, things like that. Are off and and it's a private process. Probate is a public process. It's you know, um, you file documents with the court. Anybody can go and look at those documents. So um, it's it's a public record. Whereas trust administration is a private process and more flexible. Um, as I mentioned, in either type of document, you can um, you can create sub trusts and not only for minor beneficiaries, but also if there are concerns you want to address, or you have a disabled beneficiary, um, all things to consider there. Um, and you're not limited it by one, choosing one document versus the other, one document type. Um, marital property agreements are another way to transfer assets on your death. So typically when people think of a marital property agreement, they think of a prenup. Um, something that says, if we get divorced, you get these assets and I get this or, um, you know, things, things like that. Um, but marital property agreements are also a, a powerful tool in estate planning um, to dictate how assets are classified. So that can be important if you want to classify all of your assets as marital property because you want that step up in basis, that capital gains tax benefit. Um, you may want to consider classifying assets as marital property or for assets that aren't eligible for that type of benefit 
for example, retirement accounts, pre-tax retirement accounts have to stay in your name and are not, um, don't get that step up in basis. So for those assets, it can be simpler and more efficient to administer those by classifying them as individual property and requiring that you name your spouse as the as the beneficiary. So um, there's also a statutory provision that allows you to um, direct how assets are transferred on your death in a marital property agreement. So in that sense, it can act almost as a, a blanket beneficiary designation to um, direct how those assets transfer. So it can be a very powerful tool. Um, and certainly when anybody, if you are reviewing your estate plan, looking at your marital property agreement is um, of paramount importance because I have seen many times where somebody did not update the marital property agreement, but they made revisions to their to their other estate planning documents. And they did not realize that these other provisions in the marital property agreement would um, could override their their existing estate plan or their updated estate plan. So it's a powerful tool, but it's something that needs to be used with with caution as well. Um, beneficiary designations, um, again, important to coordinate that with your estate plan, not only who you've designated as your primary agent, your primary beneficiary, but also contingent beneficiaries. Um, and it, it's important to think through a couple steps instead of just a surface level review of on my death, I want this asset to go to this person, um, to my spouse, to my child or children. Um, it's important to think through, well, what happens if something happens to one of those people? Um, and often you might want to think through having those assets go to a trust um, especially if your retirement assets are significant or the, the beneficiary, you want to delay access to those funds. Um, it's important to carefully work through the estate planning process and make sure that your beneficiary designations align with those goals. So if you have an estate plan that says, all to my you know, to my spouse and then all to everything to my children, but not until they turn 35. But you have beneficiary designations that say directly to my children. You have not you don't have a coordinated estate plan then because you're you had intended for those assets to be held in trust for a while and to not have access to go access to those funds direct immediately, but you've undercut that position by having assets go directly to them. Um, so that is something I see a lot um, where people have not not really thought through the the whole plan and that's why it's important to kind of take a holistic view and to um, to look at look at all of your assets anytime you're updating or reviewing reviewing your estate plan. Um, again, transfer on death, payable on death designations. Some people do use these as kind of their primary estate planning vehicle. They say, well, I don't want to go through the probate process, but I don't want the hassle of setting up a trust. Um, so I'm just going to make, make my assets um, transfer by beneficiary designation or by payable on death and transfer on death designation. Um, this can be a very convenient and easy thing to do, but it is a it is difficult to plan for the next step when you do this. So if something happens to the person you have designated, maybe they they die and you are not able to update your beneficiary designation or you know they're in an accident and they become um, they have an impairment or they are eligible for public benefits, all of these things can become a huge problem if you have are not able to update your beneficiary designation. Um, and people always think they will be able to, but I can tell you firsthand that they are not always able to update beneficiary designations or they don't think to um, at the time. So that can really thwart your plans. Um, so for those reasons, I would I recommend using them as a tool, making assets payable to a trust if you have a trust plan, but not using them as your primary um, your primary metric for how, how your assets are going to be distributed. Um, and again, there, there's kind of a host of issues that it can create. 
Um, you've, you have your house that's remaining as a probate assets, but you've had all your bank accounts transferred directly to people. Now the estate has no money to pay, you know, for example, real estate taxes or to pay the utilities. So there are, there are little things like that that can, um, well-meaning people sometimes don't, don't intentionally do, but um, it can result in a lot of issues. So that's something to kind of think through there. All right, how are we doing on time? Okay. Yeah, maybe if you wanna wrap it up here in the next few minutes. Yeah, okay. Um, so in terms of retirement accounts, um, as I mentioned, there are there are specific rules related to retirement accounts and how those assets can transfer to a beneficiary, what the timing is in terms of how quickly those assets need to be withdrawn from the retirement account. Um, and effective January 1, 2020, there was kind of a revolutionary law passed, which changed how, um, it's called the SECURE Act, and it changed how those um, retirement accounts are handled. So um, prior to that change in the law, there was a stretch. Um, and what that means is for certain beneficiaries, the asset, or really for all beneficiaries, um, you could transfer a, a retirement account to a beneficiary and their, the time period over which they were required to withdraw those assets would be designated or determined based on their life expectancy and stretched over their life expectancy. Um, this was very beneficial. People were naming very, you know, grandchildren and very young beneficiaries so that those assets could continue to grow and they wouldn't need to be withdrawn very quickly. Um, so, the the Congress said, we don't like that. We want to eliminate this stretch. And now generally your retirement account assets on your death will need to be withdrawn um, over 10 years. So there are exceptions to that. Of course, there's exceptions to everything. Um, there are eligible designated beneficiaries who get to keep that stretch. And that would be a surviving spouse. Um, you can just roll that, roll it over to the surviving spouse and they act as the, uh, the new owner of that account. Minor children are still eligible for a life expectancy stretch up until the point in which they turn 21. Um, beneficiaries who are considered disabled or chronically ill under the IRS guidelines um, or people who are close in age to you. Those are all people who would be eligible for a stretch still. Um, and again, another exception to this rule is that there are certain um, non-designated beneficiaries is kind of the term that the IRS uses who are who have to take the retirement assets out of that account in an even quicker fashion. So they only get five years. And this is estates, um, charitable organizations, and other kind of non-qualifying trusts. Um, so all that is to say you need to really think through um, and have this organ coordinated and organized appropriately. Um, retirement Making retirement assets payable to a trust can be very beneficial in that it creates that coordinated estate plan, but you need to, um, the trust needs to be set up appropriately. And there are lots of different um, kind of wonky or technical things to look for there, um, whether the assets have to be distributed out to the beneficiary directly through a conduit trust or whether you can accumulate a distribution in the trust. Those are all provisions to think through and will have tax implications. Um, again, importance on beneficiary designations and making sure that if you have all of your assets going to trust for children, you would want that to match with the beneficiary designation. Um, and often it makes sense to have a coordinated plan through customized beneficiary designations to ensure that if A happens, then B, if B happens, then C. Um, it's good to kind of work through those things and, and have the beneficiary designation language match your plan. Um, and again, financial advisors are so helpful in um, making sure that these beneficiary designations are updated and um, they're a great resource to kind of work work with to 
not only implement the benefit, you know, make sure the beneficiary designation is processed appropriately, but also to kind of double check and look through things and, and make sure that it's uh, accomplishing your goals. So um, with that, we have completed the our, our little discussion here. Um, so if anybody has questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Um, otherwise, I think we are all done. You, Diana, appreciate that information. That was very insightful and helpful. It seems like every day I'm reading something about a famous person dying with no estate plan. <laughs> it boggles my mind yeah. that <laughs> people don't uh, take the time to think about the fact that when I'm promised tomorrow, um, mm -hmm. I know it's not fun to necessarily go through that process. And you think you have time until you don't. That's so it's, when we think about a financial plan, it's just so important to have that in place. Mm -hmm. But maybe comment on how often one should renew or um, review their estate plan with a professional. Yeah. So um, anytime you have a major life event or a life change, that's a good time to review your estate plan. Um, and even you know, anytime there's a big change in the law that you're aware of, if you're, you know, if you see something in the news about um, taxes or about, um, you know, anything related to, to your estate, then that's a good time to look at your estate plan. And, and also just, you know, every, I would say around every five years, it's a good, good opportunity to just check in, look at your plan, say, are the people that I named still the people I want to act in those capacities? you know, my kids are older, maybe I need to rethink this, or um, they don't need trust anymore, they're responsible adults, things like that. It's good to just double check. But um, John, to your point, I I am always surprised and not at all surprised when people, um, you know, famous, these famous people die without an estate plan, because as you, as you said, it's, um, it's not a fun topic for people to think about, but almost universally when people come in who have been really putting it off, delaying, I don't want to think about it. I don't want to do it. They, they just are kind of stuck and having somebody to kind of help guide them through the process um, is, is really, really critical. And they feel so much better once it's done. Um, they say, okay, great. Now I can forget about this. And I, I feel good knowing that I've, you know, that I've left my family in a, in a better position and that, um, that, my goals are going to be be implemented. So it's Sorry. an important Diana, thing. Not if fun. anyone on the call wants to reach out to you, how would they get a hold of you? Um, yes. So I can, um, I'll put my contact information in, um, in the chat, or um, you can email me at deisenberg at stroudlaw.com um, or go on our, our website, Stroud Willink and Howard website. Um, yeah, and, and anyone can reach out to us. We'd be happy to, to provide Diana's contact information, but I'm not seeing any hands up right now, but just appreciate all your, your time and attention. And Diana, thanks for your expertise uh, for being on the line today. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it was all very helpful information. And, and like I said, it's certainly a, a big, important part of an overall plan is uh, having all of this in place. Mm -hmm. So... So yeah, if, if anyone uh, has any questions or follow-up comments, feel free to, to get a hold of Kevin or I, and I wish you all a good week, everybody. Thanks for staying on. Yeah, thanks, everyone. Thanks, Diana. Appreciate Thank you. it. Okay, bye, everybody. Yep. Take care.